morning, everybody. Well, I can't say morning, can I? Because you might be watching this in the middle of the night or the afternoon or something. But uh, wherever you are watching the Court of Public Opinion from the garage, welcome. Uh, Peter Clayton's behind the camera. I'm Jeremy Cordo. Um, uh, I better correct that mistake from yesterday, Pete. I said Annie Oakley was born on this day, meaning yesterday, uh, 1960. Well, not no, it was 1860. <laughs> 1860. Uh, and, and when Pete pulled me up, I went and looked at my dates again, and it had it right. It had it right. I just got it wrong. Uh, now, this was something that uh, was sent to me by Wendy, who lives in America uh, and uh, watches our program, and in fact listens to our show on Friday, 9 till 12 from the dining room table, jeremycordo.com. Um, Wendy lives in Austin, Texas, to be precise. Now, tell me, uh, what do you think of this? Uh, what she sent me started out, did you know that 2,300 years ago, long before Islam, Arabs discovered that forcing people to cover their noses and mouths broke their will and their individuality, depersonalized them, but most importantly, made them submissive. Now, Wendy obviously knows that it does come up in conversation here in the garage from time to time, and she's, she's given me the benefit of her research. She goes on to say, that's why they, the Arabs, long before Islam, imposed on every woman mandatory use of fabric over the face. And then Islam came along and turned it into woman's symbol of submission and respect to Allah, also the man who owned the harem and the king. Modern psychology explains it thus. You see, without face, we don't exist. We don't exist as independent, thinking, individual beings. The child looks in the mirror, and between the ages of uh, two and three, and he or she discovers himself or herself as an individual. The face covering, the mask, is the beginning of deleting individuality and controlling. And, of course, as I said, instilling submissiveness. And Wendy goes on to say, he who does not know his history is condemned to repeat it. Wendy, thank you. I didn't know any of that. Well, I sort of suspected it. Um, I always associated the uh, face covering with Islam, but as you say, it was way, 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 way before that. But I totally agree. I'm not a psychologist, but I think that what you say is right. Then I've got to ask myself, well, why, why would women do it? Why would women cover their faces? Fear. Fear. The reprisal. I mean, they, they don't have a choice. But it only, it only happens, it would seem, because you see little girls running around in the Middle East, and they aren't influenced to or forced to wear the veil. That only happens, I guess, at around puberty. Yes, that's right. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting. The government has been warned by the Reserve Bank of Australia, the independent Reserve Bank of Australia. I wonder how long they're going to be allowed to remain independent. Uh, anyway, the government's been warned that inflation is an ever-present and urgent problem to be fixed. Now, the very next day after this statement by the Reserve Bank, the very next day the Prime Minister announces that the government will spend $3.6 billion on a pay rise for childcare workers. Now, no one would deny childcare workers or teachers a pay rise. But I, I just found it incredible that after being told 
that the government should curb its spending because of inflation, they make that announcement. This is of course on top of the billions that they'd put into aged care. Disability workers are lining up for similar treatment. Listen, this is inescapable. State and federal government spending is a major cause and contributor to inflation. The government would love a popularity boosting interest rate cut from the RBA before the election, but clearly this is not going to happen. Won't be happening. But on the subject, same subject, rather than controlling inflation with interest rates, which is often described as a very blunt instrument, there are other levers to pull. Now there's the GST for a start. The GST could be temporarily raised. This is a break on consumption which would be much more effective. You see inflation, the textbook definition of inflation is uh, too much money chasing too few goods and services. So if those goods and services look less attractive because of cost, we won't spend money on them. Hmm? Now another way of taking money out of the economy, apart from stopping the government spendathon, state and federal, another idea temporarily lifting the personal contribution that we make to superannuation, resulting in less money in our pocket, less money to spend, but you get it back later. Perfect. I mean, I call that lateral thinking. Anyway, have a think about that. Before the Senate this week, um, yesterday in fact, a bill to clean up the NDIS. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! It will control the amount of money that can be spent. Will it? Will anybody oppose the suggestion? The compulsory registration of providers. Would anyone oppose that? If so, why? Why would you possibly oppose controlling the quality, standards and safety of providers? Will this government cancel the blank cheque that is currently the NDIS? Will this bill rein in the expenses? Fire the minister? <laughs> I doubt it. I doubt it very much. Working from home. Is that good anymore? Pete, what do you reckon? Oh, look, I don't think it's a good thing. No. I mean, I'd like to do it. <laughs> when I was working, yeah. it's not good for the economy, I don't think. Well, we need, to, we need to talk about it because of productivity. Productivity is going through the floor, and this working from home business is suggested as a major cause. But I've got to be careful, or we've got to be careful, as this very broadcast podcast is coming from home, as it does on Friday at the dining room table. But we are quite productive, aren't we, Pete? We are, yes. We are, I think. <laughs> now, this, this came up again because the New South Wales government has ordered its 400,000 public servants back to work in the office. 400,000 public servants. I bet they don't like being called public servants either. No such directive from our government, which is a bit of a pity, because apart from productivity, clearly there are other knock-on consequences of empty cities, CBDs, central business districts. A lot of businesses who depend on city workers have had to close. You walk around Adelaide, it's, it's terrible. You know, closing down signs and closed up signs, boarded up windows. I know it's the case here in Adelaide, but uh, I would imagine it is the case all over the, uh, all over the country. Um, I, uh, he who pays the piper calls the tune. I don't think that uh, uh, all the years I spent being a, an employee, and then at, at the latter end I was an employer, 
but the point is, uh, if the boss says, this is where you work, here's your desk, here's your studio, here's your... That's it. You can't say, oh, no, no, I, I want to do it from home. I, it's weird. <laughs> weird, 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 weird. Uh, Tom Pritchard, I don't know if you know the name Tom Pritchard. He, he died at the age of 102 the other day. He was the last link to the 14,000 Australians who served in World War II in Tobruk, the rats of Tobruk, uh, led by one Lieutenant General Morshead. Uh, he was the commanding officer. Uh, on Friday, we talked to this wonderful guy. He's only 22 years old, a fellow called Lachlan Gaylord. Um, he's, he's based in Melbourne, and he heads up the uh, Rats of Tobruk Association. And what a what a uh, um, inspirational young man. Knows his history, and uh, loves Australia. I got a great buzz out of talking to him. And we also talked about this great explosion in the sale of romance novels. The Mills and Boone outfit celebrating 50 years in Australia this week. They've got a convention at the end of this week, next weekend, here in Adelaide. And uh, romance writers are coming from everywhere, apparently. <laughs> Mills and Boone. They've been publishing these uh, romance novels for years since, uh, what, 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 what did we say, 1904, I think. Sales have doubled in the last 20 years and in the last two years have doubled again, 40% up on last year. Uh, it's a most interesting thing to talk to uh, romance writers. Fiona MacArthur was on the show. In fact, she's, as I say, coming to town next weekend, this coming weekend. I think I'll try and get her back on the show. I think I will. Is this the end of contact sport, Pete? Oh, look. It, it may be. The, co the concussion thing? Yes, yes. Professional sport. Bangs to the head. Concussion. A major worry. But not just football. It's boxing. But football, soccer. You know, it's the one occupation where when you, you go to work, you're not covered by workers' compensation. And you can be pretty certain you are going to get banged up, injured. Maybe slightly, maybe seriously. People are forced, if they want to, to seek cover independently. And now these companies, insurance companies, including one of the biggest, Zurich, have refused to cover sports people. Which, when you think we're talking about payouts in the past as high as a million dollars, is understandable. Now, what it means, in effect, you take your life in your hands, you go to work, you play your sport, you earn your living, but you do it at your own risk, your own peril. I mean, I wouldn't risk it. Um, you're going to get knocked on the head, aren't you, Pete? Well, you are, but I think, I mean, I played football, I loved it, but uh, I think my penny's worth is that they need to slow the game down again. Slow it down. Why did it speed up? Well, they, they just changed rules that enabled, uh, with the interchange, you see, now players can come off for a rest. Yes. Back when I was playing footy, back yeah. in the 60s, whatever, you didn't get a rest, you had to stay on the field. So now players can run all over the field at, at, at faster speeds. Yes, yes, so oh, that makes sense. Collision. Did you get injured? No. Oh, I had concussion once. But, oh. uh, that's all right. Oh, just sit there and relax. I'll make you a cup of tea later. <laughs> now, I've been talking about our sovereignty and our independence here in Australia for years and how we must treasure it, preserve it, value it. It worries me greatly to hear that our food security is at risk. Now, we've talked about it. We face the danger of not being able to produce enough food to feed ourselves. That's horrifying. That's amazing. Tanya Barden of the Australian Food and Grocery Council is going to join us on Friday, live streaming, jeremycordo.com. But in the meantime, if you look at your Facebook posting, the Court of Public Opinion, I'm not sure which one it was, but um, uh, we got stuck into it. But we have to 
keep talking about it. It's, it's very important that we wake up and we, we understand what we're doing. Uh, this idea of helping people in third world countries, fine, but it doesn't mean we become a third world country, which is fast what we are doing. Uh, it's the cost of electricity, it's the cost of labour, it's government rules and regulations, it's the trade unions, it's a familiar story. Now they are driving the big food producers to set up in uh, South Africa, uh, Argentina, Brazil, where they'll just close down their operation in Australia and we immediately become vulnerable. Now it's up to us to see to it that that does not happen. <clears throat> and why we have a government that presides over that, I have no idea. No idea. National Stroke Week, uh, 387,000 387, people experience a stroke at some time in their lives. In uh, 2020, there were nearly 40,000, 39,500 stroke events in Australia. That's more than 100 every day. National Stroke Week. Um, 15 boats in June. These are asylum seekers. 15 boats in June, two in July. Now four more boats have been found on the Kimberley coast uh, in Western Australia. Uh, Monday and Tuesday last week, in fact. Very, very hard to police a coastline as big as uh, Australia. But somehow we've got to do it. We really have to do it. Um, how could we be so silly? One more thought before I leave you. We face a continuous and dangerous shortage of eye fluids. You know, uh, in, in, in your veins, you know, it's used for, oh, every operation and, and so many procedures, IV fluids. I'm told there is one supplier in China one supplier in China? Why would you put yourself in such, uh, such a vulnerable position? You'd surely have multiple suppliers for something as important as that. Vital, these IV fluids. Anyway, I, I'm, I'm assuming one learns these lessons in life and no longer will we be relying upon one supplier for our IV fluids. But it is a major problem if you haven't heard um, thank you very much for viewing the Court of Public Opinion. I'll just mention one of our wonderful sponsors. You know about the Rising Sun Inn at uh, Kensington. Our telephone number again, 83330721. They are lovely people in a beautiful pub. Best pub in uh, South Australia. Best pub, best inn in South Australia. They recently won that award. And if you go into their very atmospheric bar, you will see it, the award, I mean, hanging on the wall. And our other sponsor, too, is Elder Fine Art. Now, Elder Fine Art, they have four auctions, sometimes five auctions a year, and they're always looking for important Australian and international art. And if you have a painting that you would like to sell, or you've got some doubt about its value, uh, all you've got to do is to ring Jim Elder. I'll give you his telephone number. 8-267-2869. That's 8-267-2869. And he will give you an absolute free, absolutely free appraisal of that painting. And you might say, wow! <laughs> I, I like the painting, or well, you might not even like the painting. Uh, I think I'll sell it. He's the man to do it because he has people who uh, tune into his uh, online, because his auction is both in his beautiful gallery in Melbourne Street, North Adelaide, and online, and he has people bidding all over the world for paintings. He sold a uh, painting uh, last December for over $40,000, a Hans Heysen. 
Now, it's the 14th. Happy birthday. Happy wedding anniversary. 1945. On this very day, VJ Day. Victory over Japan. The Empire of Japan surrenders unconditionally to the Allies, ending World War II. August 15 in Japan and other countries, depending on the time zone, but uh, August 14th, VJ Day. France introduces motor vehicle registration, including a driver's test. Hmm. 1893. On this day, Philips makes its one millionth radio on this day in 1932. Japan's first patent is issued on this day in 1885 to the inventor of a rust-proof paint. Ah, one from the West, Pete. Yeah. Doc Holliday. 1851, American dentist, gambler, and gunfighter. <laughs> he was born in uh, Santa Monica, California. Uh, what am I saying? No, no, no. Uh, he was born this day in 1851. And he died 1887. That was not a long life. Consumption. Yes, that's right. Yes. Um, do, do, do. Susan Olsen, American actress, Brady Bunch, Cindy, born Santa Monica, California in 1961. Oldest known, exactly dated, printed book. Circa three years after Gutenberg. 1457 on this day. The oldest known exactly dated printed book. Hmm. 1945, Steve Martin. Steve Martin, uh, American comedian, banjo player, author, actor, parenthood, the jerk, Roxanne. And uh, he's got a new uh, thing which I think is very, very clever with Martin, Martin Short. Um, uh, what is it called? Murders only in the apartment. No, murders only in the building. It's something like that. Murders only in the building. And you get, you, you get it online on one of these streaming things. I found it by accident. I don't know. I don't go streaming very often. Uh, Michael Jackson buys the ATV music, uh, including all the publishing rights of most of the Beatles back catalogue, for $47 million. Ten years later, he sells half his interest in the collection, to Sony for $150 million. <laughs> uh, 1985. Nice one. Nice one. Uh, Sarah Brightman, British stage actress and singer, Phantom of the Opera, Sunset Boulevard, ex-wife of Andrew Lloyd Webber, 1960. Born on this day, Enzo Ferrari, the Italian racing driver. Um, Founder of Scudure Ferrari, Grand Prix motor racing team and sports car manufacturer of the Ferrari, dies at the age of 90 in 1988. The man who described the E-Type Jaguar as the most beautiful car in the world. Here's a pretty all right too. Pretty all right. Um, Catherine Bell, one of my favorites. Does that name ring a bell, Pete? No, Catherine Bell? <laughs> Catherine Bell, the British American actress, she was most famous for her work in JAG. She was um, uh, Sarah McKenzie, Mac, Colonel Mac, Colonel McKenzie. Uh, she was also in The Good Witch. Uh, she was Cassie in The Good Witch, born in London in 1968. One of the Honestly, most beautiful looking women. Just, just fabulous looking woman. Thanks so much for being with us. Now don't forget to join us on uh, Friday, 9 o'clock till 12 at the dining room table, jeremycordo.com, live streaming for three hours. Um, and uh, you can ring us. We've got a whole stack of interesting guests for you to meet. Thank you very much for being with us. I must tell you, we had a lot of fun last 
Friday, I eventually got up and walked out. We had Leon Biner uh, and uh, Peter Macon. Paul Macon. Uh, Paul, Paul Macon. Paul Macon. <laughs> By Peter, Paul and Mary's yeah. mixed up. <laughs> Paul Macon and... Uh, and uh, um, yeah, and they they took over. <laughs> it was good. Uh, it was good fun. They, they 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 absolutely took over. In fact, I think we'll probably do more of that. Yeah, and oh, we'll see you Friday, Peter. Uh, <laughs> Paul, Paul, Clayton. Paul Paul Clayton and Peter Macon. <laughs> uh, there is a Peter Macon, you know, uh, the uh, news director at Channel Nine for many many years, and he was at Ten before that. Anyway, I'll shut up and get off. See you Friday. Believe in yourself and thank you for viewing the Court of Public Opinion. <laughs>